A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. This is the gospel of Christ. Chairman Hamilton, Vice Provost McCann, uh, Director Hayes, valued colleagues from the Toronto School of Theology, fellow bishops, devoted faculty, staff, fellows and friends, distinguished honorands, and most importantly, graduates and their families. Welcome to the 138th Convocation of Wycliffe College. This evening we celebrate the achievements of graduating class of 46 individuals who will cross this stage, who have satisfied the requirements for certificates and degrees at the master and doctoral levels. The journey for many of them has been long, expensive, and full of challenges. But we pray that the rewards exceed the satisfaction of this evening's accomplishment. For the greater reward is the gratification of seeing our gifts and learning used in the building of God's kingdom and of the glory of his Son. Indeed, it is our privilege this evening to hear about and celebrate some of the notable things God is doing. Raising up leadership in the Diocese of Caledonia, guiding Wycliffe College through the remarkable administrative gifts of its staff, proclaiming the truth of God's word in a needy and frequently hostile world in a compelling way, and exercising the compassion of Christ among some of the globe's most impoverished. In all of these things, and in our festivities this evening, we recognize the generous grace of God, and we launch our graduates in the confidence that this good and powerful grace will continue to be at work in you. To all gathered here this evening, we would like to thank you for your prayerful support of the college and its work. We regard ourselves as a beacon of light and truth in the center of the university. I want to be clear that I do not say this imperialistically, for the church is too culturally marginalized for us to adopt much of a swagger. But we have been entrusted with a word which remains forever, and we continue to rely on God's spirit within our community as we seek to be faithful to God's calling. True faithfulness is often tested in a largely faithless generation. However, just as the experience of exile was creative for the Jewish people, so we are being called back to our roots in an encounter with the living God, to understand afresh our place in the divine plan, and to rediscover the riches of our tradition. As our society seeks to navigate the treacherous waters of a turbulent and rapidly changing culture, 
We ask for your continued prayers that our Christian witness would inspire others to imagine a city with firm foundations whose architect and builder is God. God bless our graduates, bless our college, and bless his church. Leaders and members of the Evangelical, Anglican, and Wycliffe College communities, honorary graduates, members of the graduating class of 2018, and distinguished guests. As Vice Provost Innovations in Undergraduate Education, it is my great privilege to bring greetings this evening on behalf of Chancellor Wilson, President Gertler, Vice President and Provost Regeer, and the entire University of Toronto community. I am pleased to join in Wycliffe's College's Convocation Ceremony, and I'm delighted to congratulate the members of the graduating class of 2018. Today, the University of Toronto continues to host a robust dialogue between theology and its faculties of arts and science, medicine, and law. Through this creative and collaborative work, we recognize the continuing importance of the role of theology in higher education. Through the partnership established by the Toronto Schools of Theology, this mission has been amplified as our institutions have grown together over the past four decades. I am honored to celebrate with Cliff College in advancing the venerable academic discipline in the context of our modern world. True to tr tradition, many of you have spent years diligently learning to pay heed to the challenging and profound questions currently facing our global community. It is in this perseverance that bodes well for the future of social justice and for you, its stewards. Your contributions are valuable, not only to people of faith, but also to the University of Toronto, to the wider academic community, and to our society as a whole. I would like to note one other important tradition being honored here today. Many of the today's graduates are receiving conjoint degrees, having been approved by Wycliffe, the University of Toronto, and Toronto Schools of Theology. Our conjoint degree recipients have the privilege of claiming membership in the alumni of both Wycliffe College and the University of Toronto. This provides a dual source of pride as you look back on this wonderful milestone in your lives. And to everyone graduating and being honored today on behalf of the University of Toronto, congratulations on receiving, reaching this day and on the years of hard work and perseverance that it represents. I wish you success and happiness in the next chapter of your lives. Thank you. As we gather as a community, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the Toronto School of Theology, its member colleges, and the University of Toronto operate. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional lands of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, also known as North America. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and to live on this land. David Thomas James Lehman, Mr. Principal, distinguished guests, members of convocation. As his classmates and floor mate at Woodcliffe, it is my honor to introduce to you Bishop David Lehman. Bishop David was born in Toronto and raised in Fort Smith, Northwest Territory. He completed his BA in History at Camrose Lutheran College in 1990. While working on his MDiv at Woodcliffe, he enlisted in the Naval Reserves. Upon completion of seminary, he was ordained and served in Fort Simpson, Northwest Territory. Throughout his parish ministry in the Northwest Territories and Alberta, he was actively engaged in community initiatives, heritage projects, and fresh expressions of ministry. 
Bishop David is currently the Bishop of Caledonia and is writing his dissertation for a Doctor of Ministry at the Trinity School of for Ministry. I present David Lehman to receive the degree Doctor of Divinity John Dinnick Patis. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum doctoris in divinitate, jure dignitatis, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Fleming Rutledge. Mr. Principal, distinguished guests, members of convocation, Fleming Rutledge is a native of Franklin, Virginia, located in the historic Tidewater region. Years of living in New York have not erased that honeyed accent. She graduated from Sweetbriar College with highest honors in English. Shortly thereafter, she married a handsome U.S. Navy officer named Dick Rutledge, who has been her companion in many adventures across the decades. They have two daughters, Hayward and Elizabeth. Fleming's formative years coincided with the civil rights movement, and indeed a concern for justice for African Americans and other oppressed groups has been a hallmark of her preaching and theological writing. For a time, she was involved with a remarkable journal called Catalogata, or Be Reconciled, put out by an eclectic and racially diverse group of southern U.S. Christians. Race in America is perhaps Fleming's prime example of the doctrine of original sin. Fleming's thirst for an intellectually formed and responsible faith led her to enroll at Union Theological Seminary in New York, where she studied with such luminaries as Paul Lehman, Raymond Brown, Christopher Morse, and J. Lewis Martin. Martin's apocalyptically inflected reading of Paul would be a decisive influence on her mature theology. She would go on from union to become one of the first women ordained to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church. She served for 14 years at Grace Church in New York City, having a hand in that congregation's vital small group ministry, and has also served parishes in suburban New York and Connecticut. She has twice been a member in residence at the Center of Theological Inquiry in Princeton, as well as a visiting scholar at the American Academy in Rome. It would be easy to describe Fleming Rutledge's approach to preaching using a saying often attributed to Karl Barth, namely that the preacher should have the Bible in one hand and the daily newspaper in another. Fleming's sermons and the footnotes to her books do indeed abound in references to contemporary politics, literature, art, and film, which she skillfully uses to diagnose the ills of the present age. And yet the Bible and newspaper image does not quite capture it. For Fleming, it is less a matter of correlating the Bible and the modern world, and more about viewing the world through the lens of the Bible, employing what her beloved mentor, Lou Martin, called bifocal vision. It is not the gospel that needs to be made relevant to our lives, but our lives that need to be made relevant to the gospel. To hear Fleming preach is to know that Jesus the crucified is alive and makes all the difference, especially for those whom the world deems to be of no account. She understands the biblical grammar of death and resurrection. 
Fleming's sermon collections include the Bible and the New York Times, and God Spoke to Abraham, and The Undoing of Death. They have won her a wide following among Christians of diverse traditions and confessions. She has won plaudits as a conference speaker, a blogger, a twitterer, and an interpreter of the theology of J.R.R. Tolkien. Her magnum opus to date is The Crucifixion, Understanding the Death of Jesus Christ, which won Christianity Today's Book of the Year Award for 2017 and led to an invitation to appear on the Cardinal Archbishop of New York's weekly podcast. Not long ago, I had occasion to address a gathering of bishops of the Anglican Church of Canada. I told them they should read this book and have every priest in their diocese read it. I repeat this advice for the present gathering. Wycliffe College has been blessed to count Fleming Rutledge as a friend and supporter over many years. She has preached in our chapel, taught in our classrooms, and mentored our students. We wish she could stay with us longer on this visit, but unfortunately she has to leave directly from this convocation to catch a plane to Calgary, and thence across the Rockies by rail to Vancouver. We wish her Godspeed. Mr. Principal, distinguished guests, members of convocation, for her lifelong ministry of preaching, teaching, and writing, and for her many other contributions to the upbuilding and mission of Christ's Church, I present Fleming Rutledge to receive the degree of Doctor of Divinity, honoris causa. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum doctris in divinitate, honoris causa, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Wendy Lamarckand. Mr. Principal, distinguished guests, members of Convocation. In 2012, Grant Lamarckand was appointed Bishop of the Horn of Africa, and he and his wife, Dr. Wendy Lamarckand, moved to Gambella, Ethiopia, the poorest and least developed area of one of the poorest nations in the world. Here, among other things, Wendy established the Mother's Union Community Education Program. She taught women many of the simple things that can be done to save the lives of men, women, and especially children. Perhaps more importantly, she empowered those women to go back to their communities and teach those skills to others, thus multiplying her ministry a thousandfold. Before Wendy left Ethiopia last year, she was able to hand over the leadership of the Mother's Union Health Program to African leadership. Here is what one of those women wrote. I give thanks to Mama Wendy because she really brought us the first seed. She opened the minds of the Mother's Union to make them aware about all these problems, where the sickness are from, and how they can save their children. So now many children will become alive because of what we have learned. These teachings will be help for us, and they will help our children and even to our grandchildren. We will keep passing on the knowledge to the generations. I'm delighted and honored to present Wendy Lamarckand to receive the degree of Doctor of Sacred Letters Honoris Causa.
Autoritate mihi commissa, admitote ad gradum doctoris in sacris literis, honoris causa, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Peter Brian Patterson. Peter's qualifications for this degree are clear and strong. Having grown up as a PK, Peter has been a faithful, lifelong member and lay leader in the Anglican Church of Canada, most recently at Christ Church St. James, Etobicoke. A graduate of the University of Toronto, he rose due to actuarial and business skills to become, in 1986, the president and CEO of the Mercantile and General Reinsurance Company in North America, and he led that company successfully and with the highest standards of ethics and care for the people with whom he worked. In a golden example of Eugene Peterson's definition of discipleship as a long obedience in the same direction, Peter began as business director at a time in Wycliffe's life of anxiety and trouble, and he has left the school more purposeful, solvent, creative, and foresighted than he found it. And in his spare time, Peter did stuff like chair the board of World Vision, be the church rep on the board of Stonegate Ministry, and, I believe, be co-founder of the Wycliffe College Fantasy NHL Group. <laughs> and by the way, I want to give a shout out, a thank you to Barb with her own Ministry of Pastoral Care, who helped make these things possible in untold ways. All of what I have said is true, but I first met Peter in September of 1999 at Sammy's in the basement of Hart House. While he was eating his lunch, his eyes were scanning the statistics page at the back of Sporting News. The arcane ball strike ratios and batting averages with men on base. And I thought to myself, Christian, numbers guru, baseball fanatic, we've got something here. So in honor of Peter's statistical acumen, let me introduce him now a second time only this time with numbers. One, that is how many nights in the winter in northern Moosonee that it was just too cold for young Peter to play hockey on a nearby frozen lake. E equals H squared K squared over 2 pi squared cosine cubed. That is the secret algorithm to understand the University of Toronto Toronto School of Theology funding formula, <laughs> which only Peter Patterson and the late Werner Heisenberg understand. <laughs> one plus one plus one equals one was the working strategy for the Wycliffe staff for a man for whom it was never about ego and always about the team. Five, the number of principles, interim and regular, whom Peter quietly steered away from the shoals of countless harebrained schemes. <laughs> Twenty, the number of years that Wick have contributed to World Vision in lieu of salary for Peter. And finally, a parabolic arc through 20 years behind all of those SWATs and staff meetings and budgets, the arc showing the number of Wycliffe students for whom Peter had a pastoral heart on behalf of his Lord Jesus Christ. Mr. Principal, distinguished guests, members of Convocation, it is my great honor to present Peter Patterson to you for the degree of Doctor of Sacred Letters, Honoris Causa.
Actoricate mihi camisa, admito te ad gradum doctoris in sacris literalis, honoris causa, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Mr. Principal, Vice Provost, distinguished guests, members of Convocation, it is my privilege tonight to present the advanced degrees, Doctor of Ministry, Doctor of Theology, Master of Theology. All of these degrees are second degrees in theology that required a previous master's degree in theology for admission. Gail Marie Henderson. Gail Marie is a priest in the Anglican parish of Muskoka Lakes in the Diocese of Algoma. The title of her thesis is Transformative Conversion in a Canadian Rural Anglican Congregation, Challenges and Responses, a Case Study on St. John the Baptist Anglican Church in Ravenscliff, Ontario. Gail Marie loved her time at Wycliffe, and her best memory was listening to her first systematics lecture by Professor Joe Mangina and realizing that she had waited 20 years for that moment. She has recently developed a nonprofit consulting firm to make what she learned from her thesis accessible to other churches that don't want to die but have no idea how to live. Mr. Principal, I present Gail Marie Henderson for the degree Doctor of Ministry. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum doctoris in ministries, in nomine patris, et filii, et spiritus sancti. Robert Lee Spruill. Lee is the rector of St. George's Episcopal Church in Nashville, which is a large, thriving church which seeks to foster a deep sense of belonging and which is a community where faith is received, lived, and shared. Lee's thesis examined the influence of missional communities on parish fellowship within St. George's Church, Nashville, Tennessee. Mr. Principal, I present Robert Lee Spruill for the degree Doctor of Ministry. Actoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum doctoris in ministries, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Jeffrey Bolt. Jeff is a longtime student at Wycliffe, where he lived and was active in the community and met his wife, Jen. He wrote his doctoral thesis under the direction of Ephraim Radner. The title of his thesis is From Butler to Thornton, a typology of conflicting readings of the two books of scripture and nature in the Church of England from the 18th to the 20th century. Jeff was ordained deacon in the Anglican Church of Canada yesterday and will be starting a curacy at Trinity Church Streetsville in June. Mr. Principal, I present Jeffrey Bolt for the degree Doctor of Theology. Autoritate mihi commissa, 
Admito te ad gradum doctoris in sacra theologia, in nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Mr. Principal, I also present to you Wesley Mills Goody and Lane Madison Scruggs for the degree Doctor of Theology in Absentia. In Absentia. Sophia Chen. Sophia is now best known at Wycliffe as the Director of Finance, but before and during her time as staff at Wycliffe, she focused her studies on the Old Testament and it is her accomplishment in those studies we celebrate tonight. Sophia's future goals include good stewardship to help Wycliffe achieve its mission. Mr. Principal, I present to you Sophia Chen. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in sacra theologia, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Yan Ling Meng. Yan Ling has been teaching in Nanjing Union Theological Seminary, which is China's only national seminary, for about 20 years. Nanjing Seminary is a lot larger than Wycliffe, as it has 500 full-time students living on campus and about 3,000 in their correspondence program. Yan Ling plans to continue to teach at Nanjing Seminary in the future. Mr. Principal, I present to you Yan Ling Meng. Autoritate mihi commissa, admitu te ad gradum magistri in sacra theologia, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Daisy Ying Mei Mu. Daisy is especially interested in the subject of Old Testament ethics and her master's thesis examined how three contemporary Old Testament scholars, John Barton, Gordon Wenham, and Mary Mills, use Old Testament narratives in forming Christian ethics. She has already begun her doctoral program at McMaster Divinity College, where she is continuing to work in the field of Old Testament ethics. Mr. Principal, I present to you Daisy Mew. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in sacra theologia, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Thank you. Mr. Principal, I also present to you Warren Craig Campbell and Axel Kazadi in absentia for the degree Master of Theology. Admito in absentia. Mr. Principal, Vice Provost, distinguished guests, members of convocation, and family and friends. It's my privilege to present those who are receiving the degree Master of Divinity. The Master of Divinity is a three-year program involving theological, personal, and vocational formation for graduates to serve as leaders in churches, parachurches, and other organizations. We'll begin with those who are receiving the degree 
Master of Divinity Honors. In addition to taking a biblical language and the Honors Colloquium course, students in the Honors stream must write a thesis or research paper. Seth Elijo Enriquez. I did the best I could on the name. <laughs> Seth is the recipient of the Bart Waters Memorial Prize for Creative Ministry. His thesis title is Elevating the Conversation, Andrew Marin and Anglicanism, a Critical Analysis. Seth loved his time at Wycliffe, where he was not only challenged to grow in his love for God and others, but also made wonderful friends along the way. He is currently serving as the Interim Youth Minister at Little Trinity Church in Toronto while continuing to explore what will come next. Double congratulations are due to Seth, who managed somehow in the past two weeks to get married. <laughs> Seth Enriquez. Autoritate mihi commissa, admitote ad gradum magistri id divinitate, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. <laughs> Alexandra Christine Pollard. Alexandra's thesis title is. Translation of John Wycliffe's De Diablo Emebris Es. She is graduating in the Pioneer Stream and is a recipient of the Irene Brock McElrin Memorial Bursary and the Frederick Bancroft Memorial Prize for Church History. Alexandra, who was the senior sacristan at the college this past year, is also the recipient of the Wycliffe Faculty Prize for contribution to music in the chapel. It is no surprise, then, that one of her favorite aspects of life at Wycliffe was worshiping together as a community. She is a postulant in the Diocese of Toronto and will be serving as the Assistant Coordinator of the Sisters of St. John the Divine Companions Program for the next year. Alexandra Pola. Autoritate mihi commissa, admitote ad gradum magistri in divinitate, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Joel David Steiner. Joel is a recipient of the Systematic Theology Prize and the Archdeacon W. Fillier Memorial Prize. His thesis title is Preaching Christ's Abundance and the Scandal of God's Givenness. Joel has been active in many ways in the Wycliffe community, not the least of which was stepping into the role of co-senior student in 2017. This past year, he has been serving in ministry at St. Matthew's Riverdale, ordained deacon last December, he will be ordained priest in the Diocese of Northern Indiana on June 23rd, but he won't be there very long. He and his family are moving to the Waterloo area as his wife, Kate, takes up a faculty position at Conrad Grable. Joel Steiner. And Joel is being hooded by Kate. <laughs> These things are complicated. Get him right. Autoritate mihi commissa, admitote ad gradum magistri in divinitate, 
nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. And now we will continue with the degree Master of Divinity. Daniel Young Choi. Daniel, who is graduating in the Pioneer Stream, is a recipient of the Stackhouse Award. Throughout his time at Wycliffe, Daniel has been very involved in ministry at Light Presbyterian Church. As a result, he often found himself juggling his studies with ministerial responsibilities. Daniel is particularly grateful that he survived the introductory course in Greek. <laughs> he looks forward to serving in the Korean Presbyterian Church, either here or abroad. Daniel Young Choi. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in divinitate, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Congratulations. Christine Elizabeth Ivy. Christine is a recipient of the Stackhouse Prize for Service and the co-recipient of the John McBride Memorial Prize for Evangelism. This past year, she was a Vice President of Spirituality on the Student Council and served in many other ways in the Wycliffe community. She is currently serving as a Pastor of Discipleship at Holy Trinity Thornhill as she continues to explore what comes next. She looks forward to working in the church with a focus on discipleship, evangelism, and small group ministry. Christine Ivey. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in divinitate, nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Kenneth Michael Johnston. Ken is a recipient of the Evangelism Prize. It's been a long journey for Ken, with lots of juggling of responsibilities of family, ministry, and school. Double congratulations are due to Ken, who was ordained deacon at St. James Cathedral yesterday. He has been appointed the assistant curate at St. Margaret's in the Pines, and he will begin his ministry there next week on May 15th. Ken Johnstone. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in divinitate, nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Shirley Esther Kitchen. Shirley is a recipient of the Stackhouse Award. One of Shirley's favorite memories of her time at Wycliffe was the trip to Israel, a wonderful adventure with a great bunch of people, in spite of a flight cancellation, the bus breaking down, and six inches of snow in Jerusalem. <laughs> Shirley is looking forward to becoming more active in ministry in her home parish, of Grace Church Milton, where she will be able to use her gifts in ministry. Shirley Kitchen. Mm -hmm. 
Actoritate mihi commissa, admitote ad gradum magistri in divinitate, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. <laughs> Diane Hikyong Lee. Diane is the recipient of the reading of liturgy and the Bible Prize. Last week, Diane was accepted as a postulant in the Diocese of Toronto, but she and her husband are still exploring the possibility of moving to Manitoba. Having served as a teacher in the North, Diane has a love for the prairie sky. One of her favorite memories of Wycliffe was surviving a contra dance with Professor Glenn Taylor at the Wycliffe at home. Diane has deeply treasured her time spent studying at Wycliffe, and that even includes the introduction to Greek. Diane Lee. Autoritate mihi commissa. Admitote ad gradum magistri in divinitate, nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Joan Elizabeth Morris. Joan, who is seeking ordination in the Diocese of Algoma, is grateful for all she has learned at Wycliffe. She particularly enjoyed the opportunities to study and learn while traveling in Israel and doing ministry in Thailand. Joan is a recipient of the Bishop Abraham Memorial Prize for Interest in Missions. Joan Morris. Autoritate mihi commissa, admitote ad gradum magistri in divinitate, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. <laughs> Shelley Ann Pollard. Shelley, who is graduating the Pioneer Stream, is a co-recipient of the John McBride Memorial Prize for Evangelism. Her best memory of Wycliffe was her first community Eucharist, where her call to ministry was affirmed. Shelley was ordained yesterday at St. James Cathedral, and she will be beginning her ministry as an assistant curate at St. John's York Mills tomorrow morning. <laughs> we hope she gets a good night's sleep. <laughs> Shelley Ann Pollard. Autoritate mihi commissa, admitote ad gradum magistri in divinitate, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. <laughs> Melissa Catherine Ritz. Melissa is the recipient of the O'Meara Memorial Prize for Pastoral Theology and the Leonard Griffith Prize for Expository Preaching. One of Melissa's best memories of her time here was learning to play basketball with Wycliffe's intramural team, and she also played uh, intramural with the ultimate team as well. Melissa has applied to the community of St. Anselm at Canterbury for 2018-19 and is hopefully anticipating being able to be there next year. Melissa Ritz. (laughs) 
auctoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in divinitate, nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Brian Wishart Robertson. Brian is the recipient of the McElrin Memorial Prize for Homiletics. It will be very strange for those of us at Wycliffe to no longer see Brian showing up for classes. Some students take a little bit longer than three years. I think, however, his wife and children are very grateful that he is graduating, that he's done with school, at least for now. In February, Brian... <laughs> In February, Brian began a new position as the lead associate pastor at Seven Oaks Alliance Church in Abbotsford, B.C. Brian Robertson. Actoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad grado magistri in divinitate, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. David Blair Smith. David is the recipient of the W.D. Thomas Memorial Prize. He was ordained deacon in 2001 in the Diocese of Ontario before he even began his MDiv. He continues to serve in the Morning Star Mission, which he helped found 16 years ago. Based out of St. Mary's, St. Mary Magdalene Anglican Church in Napanee, Morning Star has provided help for the poor and marginalized through a food bank, regular hot meals, counseling services, and more recently, a regular Saturday morning worship service where David exercises his gifts of ministry. David Smith. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in divinitate. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Mr. Principal, in absentia, I also present George Russell Westgate. Admito in absentia. It's also my privilege tonight to present the student receiving the degree Master of Religion. The Master of Religion is a three-year academic program designed for people intending to serve in a variety of ministries. It includes a thesis. Sidney Alexander Baller. Sid is a recipient of the Parker Prize for highest standing in the final year. Sid's thesis is... The Nothingness, Karl Barth's Doctrine of the Source of Sin, Evil, and Death. When Sid tells people he is finished with studying, after 16 years of part-time studies and two master's degrees, they often don't believe him. And Sid tells us they may be right. Sid continues to exercise his gifts in prayer and teaching at the Cornerstone Community Church. Sidney Baller. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad grata magistri in religione, nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. 
Principal Andrews, Madame Vice Provost, graduates, families, and guests. The Master of Theological Studies degree with its urban community development stream invites students into engagement with the dual worlds of theology and development, Bible and justice. This MTS stream seeks imitation of Jesus' own nature and of his performance of holistic mission among the vulnerable and the marginalized of the empires of every age. Students in the MTSD on the one hand take the core credits of the MTS degree and on the other hand a set of development theory and practice requirements. Joanne Luella Beach. Joanne joined the MTSD program a long time ago, near its beginning in 2011. For the past seven years, consistently and persistently, term by term, she has commuted from Ancaster to Wycliffe. Joanne is director of the Global Justice and Compassion Team for the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada, and yet she has somehow managed with passion and energy the numerous strands of a full life. More than once, I recall, from the other side of the planet, Joanne has Skyped into class in the middle of her night while on another of her international work trips. Joanne will continue to do that as she continues her leadership role in Canada's international development world. Joanne is the recipient of the S.H. Blake Prize. Joanne Beach. Octoritate mihi commissa, admitote ad grata magistri in studio theologico in urbana progressione, nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Courtney Ann Reeve. Courtney joined the MTSD program as an MK with substantial international and cross-cultural experience. She has blazed new trails while at Wycliffe with her collaborative research with Becca Sawyer and Brian Walsh, and with more new trails promised by what's ahead. This despite heartbreak, severe concussion, and burning down her house. Personal disasters which the Wycliffe community, all of you, all of us, she says, provided safety, love, grief, support, and healing for her as a genuine community of Christ. Courtney's summative exercise delivered a thesis in the form of a proposal to her church community titled Finding Home, a community-based research design proposal for the building of a Free Church MB intentional community. Courtney will now focus on two things, building that intentional living community in Kensington Market, you can sign up at the back, and full recovery from post-concussion syndrome. Courtney is the recipient of the Reverend Alfred Freeman Traverse Memorial Prize. Courtney Ann Reeve. Autoritate mihi commissa, admitote ad gradum magistri in studio theologico in urbana progressione, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Before I begin my remarks, I want to draw attention to something we don't very often do here at Wycliffe. Uh, over in the corner here is a group of faculty from other schools at the Toronto School of Theology who have given up their night to come and represent their institutions and also to represent their partnership with us in uh, the Toronto School of Theology. So I wonder if you might just stand up and we'd uh, be glad to give you a round of applause and to say thank you for coming. It's a very generous gesture on your part. Uh, 
Um, Principal Andrews, Director Hayes, Madam Vice Provost, Bishops, colleagues, and everyone else, including especially our graduates. It's my pleasure to present several candidates for the degree Master of Theological Studies, as well as for the Diploma in Christian Studies and the Certificate in Anglican Studies. For the degree Master of Theological Studies, uh, first up is Andrew Theodore Ronald Badgley. Andrew attended St. Bartholomew's Anglican Church here in the Toronto area, and his best memories of Wycliffe are singing in the choir for lessons and carols and on other occasions. He was very active in the life of the chapel. He served on student council for one year and also as the sacristan for another. He plans further studies in the area of theology, namely in patristics, and he's the winner of the Philosophy of Religion Prize. Mr. Principal Andrew Badgley. Actoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in studio theologico, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Ryan Ball. Uh, we're glad not to be saying goodbye to Ryan. We're very pleased that he's accepted uh, an invitation from us to do PhD studies in Old Testament at Wycliffe coming this fall. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Ryan Ball hails originally from British Columbia. He is blessed with a loving wife and three children. And among other good things uh, Ryan is remembered for is his discipline of being at that same study desk in the student lounge from the same time every morning until the same time late afternoon. His thesis title had to do with the uh, evaluation of Kohelet, or Ecclesiastes, according to the appendix of that book. And he has been awarded the fourth Bishop of Toronto Prize for Hebrew, Ryan Ball. Actoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in studio theologico, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. David, David Michael Dixon. David, too, comes from BC originally. His home church is the Cornerstone Christian Community Church in Markham. David is married and has two daughters. Highlights for David included what he calls certain aha moments in class when he learned something uh, new and um, provocative. Um, he was interested mostly in theology and history in his time here. And for any faculty who are tempted to think that they have a lasting influence on the lives of a student, he noted he was here for seven years. He had 18 classes and 12 different instructors. So any influence we have is modest by that scale. His thesis is called Theological Idealism, Political Reality, and Martin Luther's Vision of Authority in God's Two Kingdoms. And his future plans are unclear, apart from continuing to be what I'm sure is a good dad and father and a faithful Christian. Mr. Principal David Michael Dixon. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in studio theologico, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Jose Luis Dizon. Uh, Luis, as we call him, attends Midland Park Baptist Church. And I can say from many interactions with Lewis that he is a gifted young scholar. 
It's not surprising, therefore, that he has been accepted into a PhD program in the Department of Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations at the University of Toronto, and he has been awarded a Stackhouse Prize. Mr. Principal Luis Dizon. Autor Tate Mihi Kamisa, admitted te ad gradum magistri in studio theologico, in nomine Patris Atilii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Michael Martin Chester Reardon. Michael attends a church called, literally, the local church in Toronto. And as I learned that, I wanted to say that many of us attend one of those, but it's actually <laughs> not that one. This one is in Carnforth Road in North York. His thesis title was The Pneumatic Agape as Ecumenical Ethics, a case study of Nicholas Zinzendorf and his community at Hernhut. Uh, he has a lesson to share from Professor Mangina, and that is he was grateful to have been taught to engage charitable readings of theology rather than overly critical and polemical ones. God willing, he'll return to Wycliffe for PhD studies this September, and he's the recipient of the John E. Gibson Memorial Prize for Ecclesiology. Mr. Principal Michael Reardon. Autoritate mihi commissa, admirate ad gradum magistri in studio theologico, nomine patris atilii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Anandaraja Sinadurai. Ananda attends York Minster Park Baptist Church which in my experience is about as close as one can come to the Anglican Church of Canada while remaining a Baptist. <laughs> Anandara has fond memories of Wycliffe, which include daily chapel services, community meals that are free, and that every professor begins his or her class with prayer. Uh, Ananda is the recipient of the Wilhelmina Doolin Prize for success at studies despite facing adversity. Mr. Principal, Anandara Sinandurai. Autoritate mihi commissa, admirate ad gradum magistri in studio theologico, nomine. Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. John Ryan Norman Smith. Ryan's thesis title was Jesus Christ, the Old Testament and Revelation, Divine Transcendence in Irenaeus and the Problem of the Novelty of Christ. He is the recipient of the Bishop Ted Scott Prize in Christian Social Issues, and his best memory of Wycliffe is playing with children in the hallway of Wycliffe, many of who was, uh, many of those children are his own, um, <laughs> after the Wednesday Community Supper. I, originally he wrote down he was chasing children in the hallway, but that didn't sound right, so he was playing with the children nicely in the hallway. <laughs> Ryan Smith, Mr. Principal. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad gradum magistri in studio theologico, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Amen. 
Thomas David Warwick. Thomas David Warwick uh, comes from St. Augustine's Anglican Church in Lethbridge, Alberta, which is one of the more special churches to us. We have a long history of receiving students and welcoming them, welcoming them from St. Thomas's in Lethbridge. And after graduation, uh, Thomas aspires to work abroad as a missionary, Mr. Principal Thomas David Warwick. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad grata magistri in studio theologico, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Clark Andrew Whitney. Clark has uh, been involved most recently with the Free Church of Toronto, which is Mennonite Brethren. He is the recipient of a Stackhouse Prize, and his thesis title was, And They Will Dream Dreams on the Relation of Aging to Calling. His future plans are to age well, to listen in community for God's ever-present calling. Uh, I introduce to you, Mr. Principal, this young, ageless person, Clark Whitney, for uh, the degree. Autoritate mihi commissa, admito te ad grata magistri in studio theologico, in nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti. Amen. Congratulations. Mr. Principal, there are several people on the list to receive this degree in absentia, namely Robert Kevin Irish, Juan Sebastian Moldonado Latore, Kai Kalizia Nakazwe, Julie Barbara Shore, and Rob Leonard Sykes. Admito in absentia. Thank you. Moving to the Diploma in Christian Studies. Uh, we have one person here tonight in that category, and that is Mary Catherine Cully. Mary's uh, church is the Keswick Presbyterian Church. Uh, and in her comments, she listed many reasons to be grateful to Wycliffe including such things as providing overnight accommodation at Wycliffe, uh, hearing the singing of our recently departed staff member Josephine as she did her cleaning work, and interacting more closely with professors than she had ever been able to do previously. Upon graduation, she aspires to do community work in Keswick in association with both her local church and the local government. Mary Catherine Cully. By the authority vested in the office of the principal of this college, I present to you the Diploma in Christian Studies. Congratulations. Thank you. And finally for me, Mr. Principal, are two recipients of the Certificate in Anglican Studies in Absentia, James Paul Detrick and Roy Abraham Thomas. Admito in Absentia. Thank you. Mr. Principal, it is my pleasure to present the non-graduating students receiving prizes. Jordan Durston is recipient of the major E.A. Hetherington Memorial Prize in recognition of the senior student. He's also receiving the David Crane Memorial Scholarship for homiletics. Jordan Durston. Istvan Sapishi is recipient of the Bishop H. D. Martin Prize for Creative Thought on the Atonement. Istvan Sapishi. Amita Mansareri Richardson is recipient of the Starkert 
Felder Hauser Memorial Prize, Amita Richardson. I am delighted that Wycliffe has considered work done with the poor, something worth honoring, worth considering as theology put into practice or theology lived out. And I think this speaks well of who Wycliffe is, that they would take note of what has been done in one of the most remote areas in the world with some of the poorest people on the planet. Thank you, Wycliffe. Psalm 41.1 says, Blessed is the one who considers the poor. For the last five and a half years, it's been my privilege to live and work in Gambela, Ethiopia, right next to the border with South Sudan where I had the opportunity to teach women about health. Tonight I'd like to speak a little bit about who these people are, what their lives are like, how this work of teaching and empowerment came about, and also a little bit about the place of faith in cross-cultural teaching. And in doing this, I'm hoping to give you a glimpse of the beauty and the worth of the poor and how enriching it can be to get to know and to love them. This first picture was taken soon after the civil war in South Sudan broke out in December of 2013. Our area, Gambela, Ethiopia, became flooded with refugees. The latest UNHCR states well over 400,000 refugees have come into this area where the resources are already stretched thin uh, to breaking point, more than doubling the population. And it was beautiful to see the people in Gambela, all of them, open their homes and share the little that they had with the newcomers. These people love to share. The little girl in the photo is a newly arrived refugee her story is heartbreaking. At that time, people living in the remote villages of South Sudan had no warning that there was a war, no radio, no communication. It was just suddenly chaos, bullets flying, people screaming, houses burning. People said, we just grabbed what we could carry and ran. And when we said, well, what could you carry? They said, well, mostly our children. It would take on average about two weeks for a refugee to walk from the interior of Sudan to Ethiopia. At times they would encounter an ambush along the way and have to run again. There was no time to bring anything that could carry water, so they only drank if they were lucky enough to come across a stream. There was no time to bring any food, so all they could eat was grass and leaves. There was no time to bring a change of clothes. So as they walked through the thick bush, the clothes would shred and many arrived naked. Many didn't arrive at all. This photo was taken in Akule refugee camp about three weeks after it opened. This is the first Sunday service where 300 Christians gathered under a tree. What you're seeing here is the Sunday offering. A tarp was spread on the ground and people would come up and give. This little girl is about three years old. She is pouring out some of her food rations, maize meal. She is sharing just about the only thing she has to give. And the money collected from this maize meal is then going to go to help others more newly arriving or those in special need. Grief is a constant and uninvited companion for the poor. When I was in a room full of women, I was usually the only one who hadn't lost a child. This picture is a picture of the grave of a dear friend of ours, a Julu, a young man in his late 30s, with 90% unemployment in the area, one working adult like a Julu 
would support, on average, about 16 adults and all their children. This is Ajulu's niece, lingering after the funeral. She has lost her uncle, and she has also lost the assurance of being able to have a meal every day. Who will take care of me? She's crying here. But the thing that stands out to visitors the most is the joy that is evident on the faces of these people, especially as they worship. This picture was taken at that same Sunday service in a Kule refugee camp. This young man is also a newly arrived refugee. You know, I think in our culture, we tend to substitute pleasure for joy, because pleasure is something we can get, or maybe we can control a little bit. And pleasure is destroyed by suffering. Joy flows from love. It is not destroyed by suffering. This young man knows he is loved. Now, just to put things into context, this is the diocese where my husband Grant and I served for about five and a half, almost six years. This is the diocese of Egypt with North Africa and the Horn of Africa. You know, most countries have many dioceses. Our diocese has many countries. (laughs) <laughs> Tunisia, Libya, Algeria, Egypt, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Somalia. My husband Grant was area bishop for the Horn of Africa and responsible for the work of the Anglican Church in those last four countries that you can see here, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Somalia. You can see the, uh, the Gambella region circled up there. It's a little area, the the part of it, the little area surrounded on three sides by South Sudan was uh, where we lived and where I got to work with the women to teach health. When I arrived in Ethiopia, I was greeted by the women of the church, most of them members of Mother's Union, and they said, oh, you're the bishop's wife. You're head of Mother's Union. (laughs) And I said, thanks. (laughs) <laughs> tell me what you do. And they were telling me how they visited the sick and the bereaved. And then I said, well, tell me, what do you want to do? What are your dreams? And what they said to me was, help us to help our children. So as I went about from place to place talking with the women, I began to find out what their day-to-day living situation was like, and also what the issues were that they struggled with, especially the health issues. And as part of learning uh, about life in this region, I did a survey of four representative villages. I sent out two of our African priests because I didn't want to get the polite answers uh, to the questions um, that they would reserve for visitors. So what I found out was that on average, a woman would have nine to 11 pregnancies. And out of that, only two to four children would live beyond the age of five years, most of them dying very young from easily preventable illnesses. I had learned from time spent in Kenya that more lives could be saved by empowering women to know the simple things that can be done to prevent and treat illness rather than by simply giving the same medicines for the same disease and sending the folks back into the same environment with the same risk, and if they're lucky enough to survive, they'll come back again with the same disease. So when the women said to me, help us to help our children, I had a good idea of what might be most helpful. Of course, I love curative care. But I knew that if I really wanted to make a difference, I would also need to teach prevention and to empower women to know what they could do for themselves and for each other. Now, none of the women in the area had had any opportunity for schooling. So I couldn't teach, you know, like fact A, fact B, fact C. They're very intelligent women, but they'd never had the opportunity to learn how to learn in that way. So instead, I made up stories and drew pictures and with drama and with a lot of laughter, we would um, learn about one or two health concepts, uh, choosing the ones that were most important to the women. Then, after the teaching, 
the women would get together like you see them here in a small group and help each other to remember the story by using the pictures. Then what they do is they take a tiny collection every Sunday, just, just a few pennies, and with it they'd buy some coffee. And then they would walk out to a village, and this is Ethiopia, so they start an Ethiopian coffee ceremony. And as they roasted the beans, the aroma would draw the women, the men, no matter what religion, they'd all come. And then the women would say, well, would you like to attend a teaching? So in this way, every week, they would reach 140 people this week, 80 people the next week, 100 the next, and they're still going strong. Now, about a year after this program was up and running, our major donor, donor uh, Anglicanate Australia, came to visit to find out how the program was doing. So he asked the priest of these women here, he asked Arash, the year before the program was up and running, how many children's funerals did you hold? And Arash said, well, I held 50, an average number. And then Eddie asked him, well, how many children's funerals have you held? now that the program's been up and running for a year. And Durash said, I've held none. And Eddie said, why? He says, well, it's the program. So I went to Durash, I said, you've got to be kidding me, from 50 to none, tell me more. And he said, well, you know, um, the women watch those who go to the program, they see their children are healthier, so they want to learn. But also, the women say, now, knowledge has given us choice. Before, we would only have to go to the witch doctor, and he would gouge out the two unerupted teeth in the baby to release the evil spirits. And then the babies would be so swollen and in so much pain, they wouldn't nurse and they would die. They say, now, we know things that can stop sickness from coming, or if it comes, we know how to take care of it, we can pray, we can go to the Mother's Union for advice and prayer. But the thing Jarash said to me that touched me the most was he said, the women are coming and they're saying, no one has ever cared for us the way you have. And we want to know this Jesus who sent you. This, the program started by bringing women from all over the Gambella region sometimes taking about up to a week to travel. And I would teach them something together. These women, the ones that were chosen, were chosen because they had a heart to share what they'd learned with others in their community. So then they'd go back to their local areas and share what they had learned. After three years, we were able to transition to a fully African-led program. So now they're teaching in nine uh, local teaching centers spread out throughout the region so they can reach more women, and women um, don't have to travel as far. Um, let me just get this. Sorry. Okay. After the local program had been going, this is now after the African-led program had been going for about a year, we, um, we were listening to the report that the African leaders were giving about the things that they had started to teach in the program. And I wanted to read you in their own words some of the things they said. So this, this first one is um, Rebecca speaking about uh, malaria. This is what she said. Many children died. So now we learned how to prevent and how to treat malaria, especially about how to prevent the malaria, because no one considered that the malaria came from mosquito. No one thought about it. So when it gets a rainy season like this, you can even sit and eat with your children. You make a fire and put some neem twigs in the cooking fire and let it smoke and the mosquito will not like the smoke of neem. It will go away. Also, you can make a mosquito net. You put it there. Don't let the children sleep without it. You see, the people thought that they were being given these mosquito nets because mosquitoes make an annoying sound at night. So they said, oh, we thought it was just to keep the mosquitoes out of our ears. 
So if you've got this choice, you know, mosquitoes in your ears at night, or this is a great net to use for fishing or tying your house together or something, well, what are you going to choose? But now, as you can see in this picture, they're using the mosquito nets um, to save the lives of their children. Uh, and that's the star of the drama, the mosquito. Uh, our um, ANUAC leader, Achwa, chose to focus on nutrition for the first part of her program. We worked with 10 people groups, and um, the ANUAC was only one of those. And this is what she uh, wrote. Actually, she started talking about water first, so I'll tell you that too. Many children are dying below five age. People, they know the problem is there, especially diarrhea. Many children are dying in the Gambella region. Now, the teaching was very, very interesting for anyone. They love it too much. But I'll go on about the nutrition. Another story that we taught is about the wise woman, that woman who fed her children. Obviously, any woman, they know that the food available in Gambella is only one type of food. Now we know that to give them different types of food is very important. Children will be strong. Even the family will be strong. And many people are interested about the help of the moringa, moringa tree. It is now obvious people are using it because they know the benefit. Any person now has moringa in his home. This helps with every disease. How many of you know the moringa tree? Well, it's an amazing tree. In the leaves of the moringa tree, there is so much nutrition. It's, it's, a, it's a fabulous source of vitamin A and vitamin C, and all the B vitamins, niacin, thiamine, riboflavin, B6, B12. It's a huge source of folate, a great source of iron, a source of calcium, potassium, magnesium. It's a complete protein. It has every single essential amino acid, every single essential fatty acid, every single essential trace mineral. It has everything needed for complete nutrition except vitamin D, which you get from the sun. And there it was growing wild in our area. So um, Achua's goal was that every household plant one moringa tree at least, and indeed they did it. This picture uh, was taken when we visited the OPO, one of our people groups. And in the front you can see that as this woman is grinding this rock hard corn called maize, She's adding in some green stuff in the corner, and those are just moringa leaves. So when we went to visit the OPO, what we saw was that no children had red hair, which is a sign of iron deficiency, and none of the children had those big, fat bellies, which is a sign of protein deficiency. My main aim in working with the women was empowerment. And I found that empowerment is something that is best done shoulder to shoulder rather than by coming as an expert who wants to dispense useful knowledge. Let me give you an example of what I mean. When I was teaching health in Kenya, a group of Western doctors came to teach about family planning, which in those days just meant how to use the birth control pill. Now, I had to be away somewhere, I missed the training, and I was interested in hearing what the women thought about the teaching. So when I got back, I said, well, tell me about what the Western doctor said, and, you know, did you like it? Well, my friend Raoul puts up her hand, she says, I want to tell you, because they came to my village, it was great. So I said, okay, tell me what they said. And she said, well, what they said is that if we have fewer children, we will have more strength to take care of the children that we do have. We'll have more food for our children we already have. We'll have more money that can help pay for their educations. And also, we'll have less troubles that can come from too many pregnancies, like losing too much blood or losing too much iron. She had clearly understood everything the doctors had taught. I loved the teaching, she said. And I said, did all the women love the teaching? Oh, yes, doctor. Did all the women understand as well as you did? 
Oh, yes, doctor. So how many people came to the training? The whole village. And how many people used the birth control pill? Not one, doctor. Not one. Now, because I had a good relationship, I could ask, well, why? And the reason was this. Ra'el belonged to a people group called the Pakat. Now, the Pakat people, they have a belief that obedient wives are blessed with children and disobedient ch wives are cursed with the death of a child. And the curse was diarrhea sent on the baby, which would kill the baby. So the custom in the Pakat people was that as soon as a woman gave birth, she went home and she lived with her mother and father on their compound, while her husband stayed with his other wives on his compound. And this was to be for a full two-year period. However, the fact is that when you look at Pakat families, the ages of the children are spaced about we're roughly about nine months apart. You see, the husbands come visiting. Now, if the husband comes to visit, you must be an obedient wife. Everyone knows that. And the gods will be merciful and spare your child. But if you take family planning, and you are planning to have your husband come and visit, the gods might see that too. And then you just might lose your child. And not one woman was willing to risk the death of her child. So now, our discussion changed from a medical discussion to a discussion of worldview. What does it mean that Jesus became a curse for us, that we might have blessing? How is it now that the village has become Christians and the husbands only have one wife? In discussions like that, there's an opportunity to discover together, to explore what builds life, what gives meaning to life. How do we choose wisely, given our situations, given what we have at hand, given our beliefs? What do we believe? Worldview shapes behavior. It shapes the way we look at health, including the choices we make about taking care of health. In Africa, the physical realm and the spiritual realm are not seen as separate things, the way they are so often seen here. The women told me, we can trust what you teach us because we can see your heart. We know you love God. Healing is never separate from prayer, and a discussion of health is never separate from a discussion of spiritual realities and belief. In Africa, the predominant view is that disease is caused by a break in relationship or a problem in relationship, and healing comes about through restoration of relationship. This is why traditionally, People would go to the witch doctor who would do something in the spiritual realm in order to bring healing into the physical realm. He would do something to restore relationship. In the West, the traditional view of medicine, certainly what I was taught in medical school, was that disease is caused by a disorder of function and healing comes about through restoration of function. It was interesting, as we studied the book of Genesis, to find that both of these approaches to health resonate with the biblical worldview. In Genesis, we see sickness and death coming through a break in relationship with the source of life. And then later on in the story of redemption, we see restoration coming through restored relationship. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life, and this is life, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you said, whom you sent. In the study of Genesis, we also see a mandate, have dominion. 
we were to take charge of and to take care of creation. To study, to understand, to take care of creation in making medicine and in taking care of the body is good stewardship of God's good creation. Revelation 21:24 says, all nations will bring their glory into the new creation. All that is good from every culture, all that enhances and blesses life is of great and of lasting value. In our area in Gambella, there is a crisis in worldview. There is a loss of the grounding wisdom of the elders. Through war and displacement, the people would say, our beloved elderly, they couldn't run as fast from the bullets. And with the poverty, poor nutrition gives shortened lives. Many times I heard, I think we used to know that, or I think my grandmother used to do that. And now the women were hearing fragments of confusing and contradictory ideas that were coming home with their school children or that were coming across the radio. And all of this contributed to a hunger to know on what can we base our lives. Tell us what the Bible says about life, they would ask. This picture was taken during the first Bible study I held at the First Mother's Union training. I chose a topic to address a predominant belief in the area. And the belief was, if my child dies, it's because God wanted him to die. And there's nothing I could or even should do about that. So we looked at the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And as we looked at Genesis and Revelation, we saw that with God, in the fullness of his kingdom, we ultimately don't see sickness, suffering, want. As we looked at the book of Philippians, concepts, as they would say, as it says, a partnership in the gospel, a participation in the spirit. When we looked at a mutuality of love in relationship, both honored and honoring, the women's faces began to light up. This is the kingdom he wants us to pray for? Do you mean it gives God pleasure that I should help my child? This picture shows the discovery of joy that's beginning to light their faces. And it is this joy, this caring, this compassion that is taking these women every week into village after village to share with respect, with love, with humor, how to care for the health of their children and families. And this is what we're seeing in Gambella the gift of beautiful, healthy children. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wendy, for your remarks. That was um, really good to hear. And what I have next is not as uh, significant, but it's a, a tradition here <laughs> at our college. And uh, this stick that I hold here is what's known uh, as the senior stick at Wycliffe College. And the bearer of this stick um, is the senior student for one academic year at the college, meaning that they're head of student council. Um, and they serve the student body. They serve the faculty and the staff and administration. And among the busyness of this past year, um, it's been a joy to serve uh, the college and a joy to serve as a senior student. And now I bequeath this stick and pass on this role to you, Ruth.
I'm going to uh, begin the blessing first in English and conclude in Ojibwe. The peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Gaye Jowen Mishanan Gichi Manado, No Sanan, Gaye Wegwisaman, Gaye Wenajashid Manido, Gaganig Gaye Gaganig Migayin. Amen.